Hi, I'm Kylie Roberts. And I'm Mel Wumwell, and we are Shift Unlimited. We are both qualified executive coaches, coach supervisors, and trainers of NLP and coaching. The world is a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous place. Every day we wake up to a new surprise. Uncertainty is chronic, instability is permanent, and disruption is common. This is the new normal. The game has changed. It's time to rip up the old rule book. It's time to define success differently. A shift is happening. The shift is unlimited. We need leaders to live more purposeful lives and to lead more impactful businesses. In this podcast series, we will be doing a deeper dive into many facets of living and leading in this modern world, from founder to scale up, right through to leaders of global established organizations. We will explore how we can be more holistic and authentic as we connect more deeply with ourselves, our relationships with others, and the wider world. In this podcast series, we'll engage in conversation together on topics that support the modern leader. We have one wild, precious life to make change for good. And whilst change is daunting, so is staying the same. Let's begin. So welcome to this episode of our podcast. We're picking up where we left off last time, and it's staggering that words represent just 7% of the rapport and of the message that we communicate. So this whole episode is around the language that we use and the cues that we get and we can see in others around language and preferences for language. So the question we ended up our last episode with is how can we use words to build more rapport more elegantly? Let's begin here. So we'll focus on the power of words and the power of the physical cues that we observe both in eye patterns and behaviors as well. 7% of all communication is words. The words that we use as leaders, as coaches, as parents, the words create an internal representation in other people's minds and our own. And when we listen to the words that people use, it gives us an indication of their internal representation. It indicates their preferred sensory language. And to build rapport using language and words, we can use the words of the other person's preferred representation system and use it to communicate more effectively with that person. Let's explore all things to do with words. Can you tell us more about what words do? Yes, words come out of people's mouths and it doesn't happen by accident. They have a direct correlation to the internal representation in that person's nervous system. It's impossible not to change someone else's internal representation because when we speak to someone, our words create their internal representation. Predicates is the term that is used in NLP to refer to these words that we're talking about, and they go with each of the main senses. So visual words create pictures in our minds. Words and phrases such as picture this, what a vision, radiant looking, sight for for sore eyes, clearly shown here. There are also auditory words. Auditory words are sounds that we hold in our minds such as that rings a bell, sounds about right, resonates with me, let's tune in, it's music to my ears. And then there's kinesthetic words. These are feeling words, both our sense of touch and also what we feel inside of our body. Words such as make contact with, get a grasp of, a rough day or a smooth journey and a bumpy ride. Olfactory is the sense of smell. Words such as that smells fishy or that smells off. Gustatory is our sense of taste, words such as that left a sour taste in my mouth, it's spicy or sweet or sour or it's a bitter pill. And then there's auditory digital, which is our voice inside our head. The words that we say when we talk to ourselves, such as that makes sense, I understand, let's consider this, take time to process that information. 
So why is it useful to know about language in this way? Well, moment by moment, when we write and when we speak, we use language usually from our preferred representation system, whether that be visual, auditory, kinesthetic, or auditory digital. And if we really listen to the words that others say, we can build unconscious rapport by speaking their language, using language that they use to speak to themselves, words from the same sensory preference. Because remember, when we match and when we mirror, that creates unconscious rapport. So there's a technical name for what we're talking about here, and it's called predicates. In NLP, we call the kinds of words, the sensory words, predicates. So the trick is, how do we infer someone else's preferred sensory system? So there are a few ways in which we can discover someone's preferences for which sense they use in language. Firstly, we can listen to the words that they are saying. Secondly, we might make some healthy guesses based on what we observe, our sensory acuity that we talked about in another podcast. There are exceptions to this, of course. These are generalizations. So for example, people with a visual preference tend to be neat and tidy. They like the way things look from their own appearance, their own presentation to the room they're in. They tend to hold themselves upright and straight and tend to move their eyes upwards when they're accessing their visual. Auditory tend to repeat back what you've said to them as it helps for them to hear it a, a second time. They tend to breathe from the middle of their chest and move their eyes side to side as they access auditory. Kinesthetic tend to walk slower, heavier. They respond really positively to touch. Their breathing can be diaphragmatic, so really deep breaths. In NLP, we also have eye patterns to observe that give us a clue as to what's going on inside someone else's mind, inside their internal representation. There is a correlation between the language that we use and the movement of our eyes. So we can use eye patterns to give us an indication of what's going on in someone's mind as well. We call this eye accessing. So let's have a look at what the patterns are that we can look out for. And you can see an image here of the patterns that we're referring to. The image is of a person who is what we call normally organized. And we'll share more about that in a moment. As you look at the image, it is a mirror image of you. So their right eye is on your left and their left eye is on your right as you look at the image. So what you see here is when they look up and to their left, they are remembering something that they've seen before, visual remembered. When they look up and to their right, they are constructing an image that they haven't seen before creating something, visual construct. So generally speaking, when they look up, it's visual. And then if their eyes move from ear to ear, it's the sounds that they're hearing. And either they're remembering a sound they've heard before, or if their eyes move towards their left ear, or if their eyes move towards their right ear, they're constructing a sound they've not heard before. And then if their eyes move downwards, downwards to their left is auditory digital. So making sense, logic, talking to themselves. And then if their eyes move down into their right, it's kinesthetic feeling. So let's just say that again. We tend to look up to access our visual sense. So if you're looking at someone and they look up into the right, they're likely accessing something visual from their memory visual recall. If you were to ask someone what the room looked like when they were in their teenage years, they would, their eyes would go here. Or maybe you could ask them the question around what was the color of their first car? They're remembering something that they've seen before. We tend to look up and to the left to access what we call visual construct. So if you were to ask what would your living room look like if, if, it, if it was papered in leopard print wallpaper, they'd have to create that image so they would go to visual construct. People give this away with their words as well when they say things like things are looking up, <laughs> their eyes go up. 
We tend to look towards our ears to access the auditory sense, as we said. So to the right is for auditory recall. If we were to ask you to recall your favorite song, for example, your eyes would move to auditory recall. Whereas someone will look to their ears on their left to make up a sound like your best friend speaking in a Donald Duck voice, for example. And then looking down to access kinesthetic, we would say things like, I don't know why I'm feeling so down today. And down and to the right when we access auditory digital. So by looking at someone else's eyes as they speak, we can determine the representation system they're using to create their internal representation moment by moment. This enables us to match and pace a person's experience. For instance, if they're moving their eyes upwards, they're accessing visual and we can respond using visual language. So is everyone the same with these patterns? Not everyone is what we call normally organized, as we see here. There are a small percentage of the population who are what we call reverse organized, the opposite of what we see on this image. And of those that are reverse organized, there's a high percentage with the left hand dominance. This, however, not, is not causal or absolute. So we shouldn't assume everyone who is left handed would be reverse organized. What's the best way to, for us to work this out? Well, there are some questions that we can use in our NLP coaching program that can be a really great indication of whether someone is normally organized or reverse organized. These are the questions that are deliberately designed to take someone into a representational system. And then we can observe their eye patterns as they do so. For example, if we want to draw out visual remembered, we can ask, what was the color of your childhood bedroom? Or if we want to draw them to an auditory construct, we could ask, what would it sound like? Or what would I sound like with Darth Vader's voice? So in our coaching and NLP program, everyone has the opportunity to experiment to, to see this firsthand and also to conclude whether they personally are normally or reverse organized. So we've talked about preferred reputational systems, but what about the least preferred? Does that matter? There is a useful practice called overlapping representational systems that we learn when we learn NLP and coaching. Overlapping rep systems is where we consciously as a coach take someone to their least preferred representation system so they can practice it and they can practice their least preferred and become much more proficient in it. It is worth doing this because as Carl Jung says, and it's also one of the presuppositions of NLP and coaching, the most flexible person is the most influential. So it's good to practice that which is our least preferred. So we hope you've enjoyed a little bit of a deeper dive into sensory preferences today and language and how to build rapport using language and watching eyes move around as you're talking in conversation with someone. And we look forward to speaking to you soon. Thank you very much for your time today. 